coming from um, the home of a Haitian woman who was uh, an activist, an intellectual, a historian. Um, so my household was filled with books and political activism. So I, I was an organizer uh, when I was in high school in New York City. Um, I'm so grateful for the background that I've had that made me who I am because after finishing Stony Brook University in three years, by the time I went to graduate school, uh, I wanted to talk about the Black Power Movement. This was difficult to do in Philadelphia in 1993. So to say you're 20 years old and you, told, you tell your mentors and advisors that, you know what, I'm going to found a whole field uh, on the Black Power Movement uh, when they said that Black Power really had nothing to offer American historians had nothing to offer African American history, was not a true uh, intellectual field or discipline, that there was no archives that you could discover. And people like Stokely Carmichael, who I just wrote a book about that was massively reviewed, that has sold over 10,000 copies, um, that, that, is, that has really been, um, Stokely is one of the most important people ever produced in the post-war history of global decolonization. People said, you know what, young Peniel Joseph, you're completely wrong and go home. And it's only because of my mother, Jermaine Joseph, and what she instilled in me that not only did I knew that they, they were wrong, but that I had the intellectual firepower and really the moral stamina to um, not only write a doctoral dissertation, but to set out to write a field of articles and books and anthologies and to try to collectively inspire other scholars. But what we hadn't had really up until the 1990s, with some exceptions which I'll talk about today, was scholarly investigation of the success, failures, shortcomings, um, contributions, and continued reverberations at the local, regional, national, and global level of the black power movement. Uh, we, we did not investigate the black power movement's relationship with the new left. We didn't investigate the black power movement's relationship with the civil rights movement its impact on the Cold War, its impact on domestic and foreign policy, its relationship with the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration, its relationship with community action programs, its relationship with anti-poverty and tenants' rights workers, its relationship with the white and black and global media, right, which many people in this audience are teasing out. And certainly I'll talk about Jane Rhodes's Framing the Panthers. We can talk about um, Todd Gitlin's The Whole World is Watching. Uh, we have Mark in the room who's written an award-winning article on SNCC and the media. Until recently, we hadn't had substantive both case studies and national studies of the Black Panthers. This has all changed. So, so what's exciting about a conference like this is to see a field come into maturation. So when we think about this movement, this movement was political, it was social, it was cultural. It was local, it was regional, it was national, it was global. It connects to presidents, it connects to preachers, it connects to politicians. Um, I would implore everybody who's researching this to look at the 1969 uh, Ebony Magazine double issue on the Black Revolution that gives you a panoramic uh, view of this period from black college students to prisoners who are organizing prisoner rights unions. When I say that black power is connected to American studies and law and society and women's studies, this is not hyperbolic. This is happening. This is happening. People are producing the case studies. And all the scholars who are interested in African American history and post-war African American history, post-war Caribbean African history, if you don't know that this is happening, it's shame on you. Because it is happening. And what we need to do is connect the dots to understand what's happening and to provide a framework. And this is not hagiography. Hey, Many of these studies are very critical of the movement, and they should be. There is nothing that we can study historically that we shouldn't be very, very critical of, right? We gain new insights when we provide an objective look at a movement or an individual's successes, failures, shortcomings. But what we've done until recently is actively ignore the black power movement. And we've done this because so often black power activists were talking about political radicalism and revolution. I, I preface my comments this way because this is a panoramic field. It's a growing field. But it's important for us to understand the impact that it's having in an interdisciplinary way. 
okay? It's having, a, it's having really a, a, a depth of impact, and it's got a breadth of reverberations that are really critically uh, reshaping the way we think about post-war American and African American history. Because remember, the black power movement is also American history. However much people try to divide and act as if black folks are not Americans, they are. And as if their history doesn't impact America, it does. And it also impacts the Caribbean, it impacts Africa, it impacts the entire world. And the interesting thing is that we are now getting the work that's dialing down and producing these case studies. This was much more difficult to talk about 15 years ago because even then people would tell me, well, where's the stuff? Where's the proof? And I used to say, well, I can't write all these case studies myself, people. I'm writing <laughs> Waiting Till the Midnight Hour, the first book, which is a, which is a comprehensive history. I'm not going to go into every single city and hamlet, but somebody um, I hope to God somebody would, and now dozens and dozens of people are doing this. So we're, we're, we're going to have a much thicker description, right, uh, as historians to work with. When we look at Martin Luther King Jr., when we read his last book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, King has one of the most eloquent critiques but nuanced understandings of black power. And certainly black power, he doesn't agree with the context of violence, that is associated with it, but he understands self-determination and political power, and King starts shifting his own language from Negro to black. So by September of 1967, at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, a conference, King can be uh, preaching, and he's actually, there's a great picture of him under a poster that says, black is beautiful, and it is so beautiful to be black. That's Dr. King. And in speeches, Dr. King starts to say that in the English dictionary, black is associated with all these negative words, and white is associated with all these positive words, and there's something wrong with that. This is not Malcolm X, this is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So there's an impact. King always stays nonviolent. He always, always stays peaceful, but black power is part of what ratchets King's political radicalism. Basically, Saturday Evening Post says we're all Mississippians and, you know, uh, uh, we all would prefer the Negro problem, the Negro problem, to go away. Um, but, but we're trying to do the best we can. And uh, they say that white people are extending a hand, however begrudgingly, they say. And black people would be, uh, do very well to, to take that hand, or else all hell might break loose. That's the Saturday Evening Post, talking about uh, an open acknowledgement and embrace of white supremacy in 1966. And this is what black power activists were up against, which is why they defined the movement as a revolutionary movement to, to end and eradicate structural and institutional racism and inequality. When you can have the Saturday Evening Post, right, embrace white supremacy and the world just keeps going, you're in a profoundly, profoundly sick country. And when we think about the national media, that's going to be the white media. Because the profound thing about black power is that there's going to be African American, especially radical media, media like uh, Muhammad Speaks, uh, certainly the Black Panther newspaper, um, Soul Book, <coughs> Liberator, Negro Digest, Black World. Uh, uh, but even things in Oakland, like the Sun uh, paper in Oakland, um, the Amsterdam News in New York City. They came to define black power as something that was urgently needed to transform American democracy. So even if some of them that weren't organizational organs didn't put a stamp of approval on, say, the Black Panthers' is revolutionary socialism, they did say that the Panthers were actually a credible uh, 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 anti-racist organization. Right? <coughs> so when we think about media here, we also have to remember um, um, the African-American media, and there's also a radical uh, black press, and really just a radical press in general. I'm thinking about Ramparts Magazine. I'm thinking about magazines that are coming out of the new left as well uh, during this period. Today, there's a, um, um, competing historiographical interpretations happening right now. And we think about um, everything from uh, Jacqueline Dow Hall's notion of a long civil rights movement. Um, but the question is, uh, where does black power fit in that? Is there a parallel long black power movement? Because that framework of the long civil rights movement privileges certain actors of trade unionism, of labor, but wh wh where are the black nationalists? Where are the pan-Africanists? 
Where's, where's Paul Robeson and Claudia Jones? You know, and, and the work of people like Eric McDuffie, the work of Dale Gore, the work of so many people are really reconceptualizing um, how we think about that early period. Framing the Panthers is the best case study that we have on media and the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And this is a very important book by Jane Rose because what she does in this book is really look at media in a panoramic way. She looks at documentary films, she looks at African American and white media um, to see the way in which the Panthers were both framed as this violent group, but that they also at times subverted that framing at times utilized that framing, at times were used by that framing, and also articulated their own frame through their own media narratives. So the Panthers both, both um, um, inspired existing media scapes, but they created new media scapes, both in-house as an organization, but also in the way they inspired people globally. Because the way in which I periodize black power in my own work is I, I argue that when we think about black power, it's not Stokely Carmichael's 66 that it's coming out of Stokely's brain. It's a pre-existing movement that's paralleling and intersecting with civil rights, and we can find it if we look, right? By 66, it becomes so overt and so apparent, Stokely gives name to a pre-existing um, 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 movement. Right? That, that is now reaching a high point and a crescendo, as movements often do. So when we think about this period, what's extraordinary for me and the work that's being done, if we can connect the dots and we can read this work that's being done, is the impact that this is having on our conception of post-war American history. Again, locally, regionally, nationally, and globally. This is connected to civil rights. It's connected to public policy. It's connected to voting rights. It's connected to what sometimes people euphemistically and negatively refer to as identity politics, which are really anti-racist politics. It's just anti-racist politics that have gotten bad public relations, right? Me being <laughs> black and proud is not identity politics, right? It's anti-racism and pro-black. It's about black self-determination. It's somebody saying they're Latino and proud. It's not identity politics. It's about self political self-determination. If you're saying you're LGBT and proud, that's not identity politics. It's about citizenship and democracy. And it's only because we lack lobbyists and we lack PR firms that people call what we are advocating for as citizenship and equality identity politics. That's the only reason that occurs. Oh, you can clap. I'll take you more. You can clap. I'll take you more. So this is an incredibly, incredibly important time, not only in our nation's history, but for those of us who are interested in this study of social movements, who are interested in the study of civil rights, black power, feminism. Um, we've got important work that connects this work to environmental history and the African-American environmental post-war history that's being done right now or in places like Chicago and New York. So there's so many interesting connections here, right? And we've got people like Derek Musgrove who've written books about black politics post-1965 and looking at what really happened when we drill down to black elected officials once they're in office in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, right? So historians are really at the cutting edge of a field of scholarship that is having reverberations for political science, sociology, women's studies, ethnic studies, African American studies, law and society, anything, you name it, right? So this is very, very important, but what we have to do is place this within a kind of framework, right? And I'm a historian, I'm not going to say it's necessarily a uh, overtly a postmodern theoretical framework, but a historiographical framework, a framework where we can understand what it is that we're doing and that these competing historiographies are not so much in competition, but in dialogue with each other, right? In dialogue, in discussion, and we're making these connections. So I'll close by saying, um, I think this is an extraordinary conference. I think that uh, this field of scholarship uh, is a hugely important field, but it's, it's also panoramic. Um, in a way, uh, this is about rethinking and reimagining through research and through scholarship, right? Uh, uh, the way in which we think about 
not just post-war American and African-American history, but the way in which we broadly conceive, think about race and democracy. Race, democracy, social movements, right? Citizenship, equality. This is all connected. So I think that uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a privilege to be here. It's an honor to be here. This is an extraordinarily exciting time to be studying this. We can look at more archives than ever. Um, we can connect this to both bottom-up social histories and so-called top-down political histories, and we can do them both simultaneously, right? Um, women are extraordinarily important here. Um, people of color are extraordinarily important. The connection between black power, uh, the new left, um, um, white allies, all these things are important. Uh, and I think that eventually we're going to have to um, um, embark on writing new histories of, of uh, uh, 20th century America, post-war America, because we know by doing this research and by publishing these books, having these conferences, these articles, that the books that have previously been written, while very, very important, have not told us the full story. Thank you.